Welcome to the Profiling Evil Podcast. I'm Mike King, and during my law enforcement career, I investigated some of the most complex crimes imaginable. Now, I use that experience to explore true crime in a way that's compelling and captivating. In this episode, we're going to be looking at the evolving dark side of Jeffrey Epstein. I'm joined by one of the finest private investigators in the world, and he's going to share some of the evidence he uncovered in this investigation. Well, today I'm pleased to to be speaking with Ed Opperman of the Opperman Report. Ed is a radio talk show host and a private investigator. And and you can catch his program every Friday night at 5 p.m. Pacific time where he interviews expert guests and authors from around the world. His program explores true crime stories, news and political topics, conspiracy theories, issues of social injustice, and and so much more. So I want to just bring him on and introduce him now. Ed, how are you? And welcome to the show. I'm very good, Mike. Thank you for having me. Well, I'll tell you, I have, uh, the beauty of the internet now is the ability to cyber snoop. And before you and I did an interview on your show, and thank you so much for inviting me over to your show, uh, I spent a lot of time doing a little research. I think you did the same thing on your side. It's like at this point in our lives, we're really kind of cautious about who we're connecting with. But yeah. t- tell everybody a little bit about yourself. I mean, I've been to your home neighborhood many times. Uh, what, what was it like, for instance, growing up in the tough streets of South Bronx in New York City? You know what? It's kind of funny because just recently, my best friend from the eighth grade just got a hold of me on Facebook. And we we're going over all the old stories, you know, and uh, a lot of them I didn't remember myself. Uh, but it was, uh, you know, a wild time. It was, you know, the uh, 60s. You know, I was born in 62. And I left uh, the Bronx in about 1976. So this was like the height of the 60s and the 70s, uh, you know, uh, street gangs and, uh, you know, it was a tough area. What I want to talk about today is Jeffrey Epstein. I mean, when did you first hear about this guy? Because uh, I think one of your first broadcasts was about him, wasn't it? Yes. In 2013, I, I heard about him. I guess like right around the time of the case, I, I read a small article somewhere about this billionaire uh, who was had these little girls coming to his house three times a day and he got off on, on the charges. And I said, you know, always stuck in the back of my head. And then years later, when I ha- had an opportunity to do a radio show, that's one of the first shows I wanted to do. I, and I said, well, who was that guy? Let me see if I could find him. I found out the name Epstein. I familiarized myself with him, but I couldn't find a guest who knew anything about him. Nobody knew a damn thing about Epstein back in 2013. Uh, very, very little online about him. And it was the first radio show. So I found Robert Morrow, uh, who is a character himself, who uh, uh, wrote a book about the assassination of uh, Robert F. Kennedy, uh, JFK. And he was uh, Roger Stone's uh, ghostwriter for a while, too. Okay, interesting character. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. And, but he knew about this. And he don't like pedophiles, I tell you that. Uh, so he uh, was familiar with the case. And then later on, when I got involved in the case working as a PI, he was also in the periphery in the background there, too, uh, with a lot of uh, influence and input with the uh, the attorneys who were, who were working the case. But he never knew I was working on it. Nobody, nobody knew I was working on it for years. <laughs> OK, I was still reporting on it on the show, but I had signed like the most super duper non-disclosure that I've ever signed in my life that I wasn't allowed to talk about it. Uh, but and I, I, I dropped some hints here and there. Uh, but uh, and I there was stuff I couldn't talk about that I knew from the case, but I was still reporting on from outside sources. Uh, and it wasn't until after Epstein died that I finally went back to the lawyer and I says, "Hey, look, man, you know I took this case at a discount because I want to talk about it someday. He's dead now. How about now?" And he says, "Yes, you're allowed to talk about that. You worked on the case, but no specific details of what I did." So I've been very good about that. That's that's amazing though, and and, and really pretty stressful to to have that kind of intel, especially with today's uh, day and age of how information leaks out, because I'm sure every time something leaked out that you had intimate knowledge about, somebody might say, well, where did it come from? And and you had to you had to establish that credibility early on so that they knew that you weren't the possible leaks. Yeah, they, you know, e- even getting involved in, because the lawsuit was the, uh, the 2015, I, I got involved in 2016, but it was a 2015 lawsuit against Trump and Epstein, but it was called originally the Katie Johnson lawsuit. 
that later on when the attorney Tom Mayer came in, on board, uh, we turned it into the Jane Doe lawsuit. Uh, so, you know, it was startling news at the time when it happened. And, and, and it was, you know, this was a scary thing to get involved in. You know, I, I was involved previously with an investigation against Todd and Sarah Palin. And getting into that, I was scared, you know. Uh, but this one, I was scared. <laughs> I was scared getting into yeah, it. Yeah. And when I actually told the story on the radio, and when I could finally reveal it, I was scared that night telling the story. And that was years later. That was after the case was dropped. And, and, uh, and how do you feel now, this many years later, when you talk about this case? Oh, boy. Well, it, there's so much. Uh, everyone's talking about it now, you know. So I, I don't worry about that. I do kind of, since Trump was involved, you know, I do kind of worry, you know, in the background, especially since I, I know some of the guys around Trump, too, his bodyguards and stuff like that. Like, I know them personally. And uh, when, when you know someone personally, especially when they're a cop, you know, uh, they're more likely to come over and punch you in the face. <laughs> you know what I mean? Rather if it's a stranger, you know. So I do. And yeah, back of my mind, I have some problems with this. Yeah. And I don't like the way yeah. it's turned out either. And I don't like that a lot of people say, well, the case had no merit. Uh, and that uh, it, it, they lost in court. Somehow we lost in court. Um, everyone, every attorney, because Tom Mayer is a patents attorney. OK, he doesn't he's not an expert in this kind of sexual harassment, uh, sexual battery type case. So we shopped it around to other attorneys. OK, high profile attorneys that I work with all the time. No one turned down this case. There's no one that didn't like this case, that didn't want this case. No one that got involved in this case has ever come back to me later on and said, hey, Ed, you stuck me with a dog of a case. Every attorney involved in this case believed the story, you know, and, and what happened. And uh, a lot of people, too, say, um, yeah, well, you know, they, Lisa Bloom, you know, made it up, you know, and stuff like that. She's paid off and all this kind of stuff. But the thing is, why would they bring in an investigator? Why would they hire an investigator, especially someone like me who was so vocal about Epstein and so passionate about it? You could hear it in my voice. Uh, why would they bring me in? It, it's insane. Because if, if and I'm also to another one too, is that since that time I've vetted out other potential victims. Okay, some proceeded, and some we couldn't vet them. We couldn't prove them. Some were outright lying to us. So you know, I've vetted several of these Epstein cases, and this one was a good one. Yeah. So when when we when we talk about these kinds of cases, uh, Ed, and we explore the case in a way that hopefully empowers people to to have loved ones or themselves not fall prey to something like this. <clears throat> we start to look into the the behavioral characteristics of, of the offender, but we also want to kind of look at the victimology or um, the, the background, kind of a, a, a almost a psychological autopsy of who the victim is in these cases. What, what in your opinion, was the preferential victim that Jeffrey Epstein pursued? Oh, boy. Uh, you know, a, a lot of those girls down there, especially the ones at the, the, the Royal Palm, uh, I think it was a middle school or, or a high school, that, that Royal Palm <laughs> school down there, were poverty. You know, the, these were poor kids. Uh, they came from poor families. And Epstein, you know, when they raided his house, you know, he found school transcripts. Uh, he had in his possession school transcripts with these kids, so he knew which ones came from troubled homes, you know. And then he, he showered them with gifts, you know, and he was very persistent with them. Uh, some of them he was so obsessed with, he would show up at their trailer parks with his Lamborghini uh, looking for them. I haven't seen her lately, Can, you know. So the whole thing was heartbreaking. You know, these were rich, powerful people who took advantage of these, not just the, the, the kids, the families too as well were terrified of this man. So uh, yeah, isn't that something that, you know, as we talk about these grooming tactics that, that people employ, uh, these predatory pedophiles in this case, and we think about that, uh, how compelling if you come from poverty where you flat out don't have a thing and that somebody all of a sudden is showering you gifts and kind of slowly bringing you, hey, all you got to do is give me a back rub. All you got to do is bring a couple of your friends and we'll have a fun party. I mean, that is so motivating because now this person living a rather mundane and really troubled life, all of a sudden thinks somebody thinks I'm really important. And, and if you add into that, you know, alcohol, you know, and a little extra freedom, you know, and indulgence, you know, a young kid, you know, you're being... You're growing up, you know, you're maturing. And if you take that different path where you suddenly you'll be given alcohol, marijuana, stuff like that, uh, you know, it's fun. You know, let's do it. You know, it's just yeah, and we 
we saw we saw with uh, in, in as I looked at things like with the Glenn Maxwell case, some of the things that I found that were so intriguing is that they actually uh, groomed the kids to become recruiters of yeah. their peers in a way that the kid and we see this sometimes in uh, sex abuse cases in families where there's a you know a, a number two dad that moves into a family or or someone that's enabling this predatory behavior. Because somehow, all of a sudden, the power or the control or dominion that that, uh, that uh, woman has or that child now who's recruiting her friends has uh, as, a, as almost a position of power within Epstein's organization, they, they, they will turn around and do the very thing that disgusts them in order to maintain and can keep that power in their own life. Yeah, and we saw that with some of these victims, too, as well. Um, also, too, remember, he had his connection to Victoria's Secrets. So he would also promise them modeling jobs and modeling careers, and all kind of stuff like that, too, as well, which is, again, another, you know, enticing thing for a young girl uh, who has self-esteem issues, you know, and all kind of problems, you know. Yeah, well, you know, when I look at Epstein uh, as a human being, I mean, he uh, he didn't excel in school. He wasn't really a great job holder. But the guy was a math wizard, from what I understand, and that's what he was able to exploit. So he took something that he was good at, and he completely turned it and and uh, and uh, used it to to impact other people's lives. What do you know about his life growing up? Well, you know, like I always say on the show, and you know, he went to a I think it was um, a Coney Island High School, okay, which was like the Welcome Back Cotter High School. <laughs> okay, just there you that. go, yeah. And somehow he goes from there to, you know, he dropped out of college early. He didn't get a degree. And he winds up working at the Dolphin School. Uh, and the guy who gave him the job there was Bill Barr's father, Attorney General Bill Barr, the CIA. Wow, Bill I didn't Barr. know that. Yeah, he yeah, said there's a lot in this story. You know, by the way, too, talking about grooming, too, I'm back to the grooming issue for a while. Do you know when they, they found his uh, Amazon uh, purchases? He had purchased a book on how to groom a sex slave. Okay, so he was he was working on this full time, but somehow he winds up at the, the Dalton School, uh, you know, with these little girls in these little Catholic school outfits, you know, and he went from there. I forget which uh, my brokerage firm it was, but it was through the parent of one of the kids at the school, one of the little girls at the school. Her parent was a, a CEO at one of these brokerage firms, and he went to work over there. Now uh, he left there. And uh, because basically, uh, I forget the guy's name, this uh, Asian intelligence guy. Uh, I forget his name off the top of my head right now. Uh, but uh, he went to, uh, he, he was like stealing money over the brokerage. So they want to get rid of him. So they went to this Chinese intelligence guy, Asian intelligence. And uh, he went to Stephen Hoffenberg, who was running uh, Tower Financial. And he went to Stephen Hoffenberg, who I've become good friends with. And he says, we want you to take on this guy. He's a brilliant guy when it comes to numbers, like you said, but he's causing problems over here. We want you to take him. So Hoffman brought him in and, uh, you know, taught him a lot. Tower Financial, uh, ultimately, I don't know if you know this story. but uh, uh, I've not heard this, no. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you got to talk to Hoffman. He's a wonderful guy. Hoffenberg, by the way, was a big Trump supporter, too. Okay? He had to bring out a pact for Trump. And he was he left the campaign when he started seeing all that stuff with Roger Stone and the Russians and all that stuff. He says, I'm getting out of oh, here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But well, here's what happened, man. Hoffenberg is running this company, Tower Financial, which was doing a lot of a financial uh, uh, activities. And uh, he, there was some uh, irregularities with the accounting. Okay, A lot of people call it a Ponzi scheme. <laughs> but Hoffenberg yeah, lives otherwise. <laughs> okay. <laughs> But what happened was now the attorney for Tower Financial, the corporate counsel for Tower Financial was Rudy Giuliani, okay? It was right out of SDNY. When they start snooping in, SDNY starts snooping in onto Tower Financial and their activities, uh, Rudy and Darren Endike and uh, Jeffrey Epstein all turn on Hoffenberg, leave him holding the bag, Hoffenberg goes to prison. It was about nine years, okay? But no... Uh, no snow melts on Hoffenberg. <laughs> no dust curls on this guy. So while he's over there, he, by the way, he was in MDC too. Okay, Hoffenberg worked with Epstein's that. Hoffenberg he does let snow dust settle on him. He's working 24 hours a day trying to get revenge against Epstein. So Hoffenberg's the guy who got this whole stuff down on the Virgin Islands going against Epstein. Do you know that? He, he's put that whole thing. No. Yeah, and it's a brilliant theory because Hoffenberg is, is left holling the bag. He has to pay back $400, uh, $400 million restitution 
to the victims of the tower financial uh, crimes, right? Now, where did Jeffrey Epstein get his money? Where did Jeffrey Epstein come up with $400 million to put down in, in a trust down in Virgin Islands? The same amount of money. Okay, so Hoffman says, hey, DA down there in the Virgin Islands, I know where he got the money, and I have a fiduciary responsibility. I have a court oh order saying I have to return this money. <laughs> this is the guy over here. I know, great story, right? Uh, you can find that story. Yeah. <laughs> If you Google, There's not a better quote than you just made. I got to interrupt you. A fiduciary <laughs> responsibility. I love it. <laughs> but it's true, though, because he, there's a court order in place. He has to obey it <laughs> to, to bring restitution. You can listen to the whole story. Hoffman is telling it to me, and it's a brilliant plan. If you Google Spreaker, Opperman Report, um, Smoking Gun, okay, and you'll find that story. It's a great story. That is fantastic. Hey, everybody, we're, I'm talking with Ed Opperman of the Opperman Report. Go to his website, uh, oppermanreport.com. Make sure you're listening to his uh, podcast. Get this interview. Uh, I'm already hooked. I mean, I got to go, go in and hear this one now. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a crook. I'm sitting in jail. It's my fiduciary responsibility to burn the guy who just yeah. burned me. <laughs> yeah, I love it. <laughs> No honor among thieves. So, yeah. so you know, we, we talk about Epstein, and and we talk about it now. If we looked at this from a behavioral perspective, Ed, and, and we go back, there's this really interesting evolution that occurs in Epstein's life, in, in my opinion, because he clearly has these pedophilic tendencies, and he's starting to experiment, but as he becomes uh, financially settled and obviously filthy rich— with that comes an arrogance of power, and pretty soon he's employing others to to help him. I mean, he's no longer the the guy in the trench coat in the black darkened alley. You know, he he's now saying, "Just bring him to my house, or I'll show up in my Lamborghini in their trailer park." Uh, I can't imagine the arrogance of someone like that. I mean, what's your thought about that? Well, remember too, you know, when the Palm Beach police down there started looking into this and they, they located and identified the victims and went knocking on their house. Just imagine dinner time, they're knocking on some kid's house and the parents are hearing this story. Oh my God, my daughter's doing what? And what? And the kid's denying it, you know? And then later on, he knew who the cops were talking to and he's renting cars for them, these kids. He has private investors going to interview them and stuff like that. All, all the, the pressure. I don't know if you ever read the three page letter. That's uh, Alex Acosta. Um, I, no. Yeah. Well, he talks about the pressure on his office and stuff like that. He's the one that gave Epstein the sweetheart deal and then later on became the Secretary of Labor for Donald Trump. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, well, he wrote a three-page letter that I fell for, hook, line, and sinker, okay, <laughs> at the time when I first read it. Because uh, there's a, see, a lot of stories planted in the news on this story are from those guys. It's from that side, you know? This, yeah, it's been a ride, man, <laughs> okay? And uh, there's so much planted in the news, okay, that benefits Epstein, their own. All the stuff you hear, too, about Pedophile Island and Lolita Express, that's all comes from them, okay? Because they want you to think that all the crimes happened on some airplane or happened on some island. But if you look at one of the latest defamation lawsuits, they put a chart of his activities and his travels. And most of the time he was in New York or Palm Beach and a lot of time over in New Mexico, which by the way, New Mexico was just dropped off the face of the earth. No one's talking about that anymore. Uh, but they want you to think everything happened on the island. And when there's an allegation against somebody who's connected to all this, right away, well, was, was he on the plane? Was he on the island? Forget the island, forget the plane. He was living, walking distance to Mar-a-Lago, okay? He was living in Manhattan across the street from Bill Cosby. You know, what's going on in that neighborhood over there? Yeah, yeah. Check the water. You know? <laughs> What's going on? You know, you hear these stories. Bill yeah. Cosby dragging a woman, a passed out woman, out of his house and throwing her into a cabin, running upstairs, and no one says anything anywhere, nowhere. This other guy's got little kids showing up at his door three times a day. No one says a damn thing nowhere. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm interested. Did did law enforcement have any pressure that you're aware of put on them by this financial machine that backed up Epstein? Yes, there was uh, the, the negotiations down at Palm Beach between the federal prosecutors, okay, and, and Jeffrey Epstein's legal team is beyond anything I've ever seen at all. You know, they were meeting in hotels and deferring, coming up with excuses on, on how not to notify the victims of the plea deal, you know, and the plea deal he finally signed was a, a sex with paying prostitutes, you know, uh, sex with underage prostitutes. 
And um, he was supposed to do 18 months, but he only did 13 months and only he slept at home. You know, he only, no, 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 he, he slept at the jail. But he had secured, oh, he had off duty sheriffs take him to his office every day, okay, where he would work all day long and then go back to the jail at night. And he had donated $95,000 and he was held in a, in a private wing of that, of that jail, okay, that was, was under construction. But it's beyond. Uh, imagination, what went on with this, the, the, the strings he was pulling and the money he's passed on and the blackmail he was using. You yeah, gotta, that's incredible to me. Yeah, you, you got to remember Maxwell, her father is Robert Maxwell, who was a total spy over in the UK involved in his own financial scandals, a blackmailer and stuff too with this media empire that he had. Uh, Epstein was at one time working for Adnan Khashoggi, a uh, uh, trying to retrieve money that was stolen from Khashoggi, uh, who was this billionaire arms dealer involved in Iran-Contra. Uh, so Epstein was up to his neck as well with blackmail and influence peddling and using these young girls to, to gain influence and blackmail dirt on people. And a lot of this stuff, uh, Mike, gets covered up in the press, okay? When I was shopping around for an attorney, uh, in my case, my first case with this, the Jane Doe, Katie Johnson case. I called up one of the attorneys I deal with all the time. And I says, hey, man, you know, I got this case, Jeffrey Epstein, and, and it's that lawsuit against Trump and Epstein. And he goes, does this involve those porn stars and stuff like that that are trying to shake down Trump? You know, he's talking about Stormy Daniels and Karen McDougal. <laughs> okay? So I knew about that way back in June and July of 2016 before anybody did. But then he tells me, he says, and, and those pictures of Trump and Clinton on the plane. Is that what you're talking about? And I says, no, no, that's something totally different. So, so oh there, were, there, were photo Mike, there were photographs at the time in 2016 of Clinton on Epstein's plane and Trump and on planes together and Epstein, okay? Now this was bought by the tabloids and squashed, catch and kill that you hear about in the Ronan Farrell book, okay? Who talks about my case too as well in the Ronan Farrell book. Uh, but the thing is, recently, we see the pictures of Clinton got out. Now, I know for a fact these, these photos were being sold as a package, but somehow the Clinton version got out, but the Trump ones didn't. Eh. Well, make of that what yeah. you will. <laughs> you know? Interest, that's really interesting. So um, as, as he uh, evolves and Epstein's moving forward, now he starts getting uh, Maxwell and Jean-Luc Brunel involved. Uh, what, what can you tell me about those two? John Luke Brunel actually sued Epstein recently, saying that he damaged his reputation, okay, by his association with Epstein. But Brunel visited Epstein in the jail down there in Palm Beach more than anyone. As a matter of fact, um, there was only a, he, he visited Epstein more times than there were visiting days available. So somehow he either went there twice or they let him go on a date when you know, he wasn't allowed. So that, I find that very interesting. It seems that Brunel uh, was part of recruiting and had some kind of a, an ability to uh, uh, get visas for, for these young girls. These K-1, no, 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 not K-1 visas, the uh, HB-1 visas uh, to, to bring these young models around the, around the country, you know. So that's Brunel's story. Yeah, and and uh, now, of course, he's, he's facing a, a bucket load of charges. He's an old man as it is. You know, it'll be interesting to see what his financial position does in just kind of extending these trials out mm -hmm. and, uh, and extending that. I don't know what his condition is in, in uh, jail as he awaits, but, but then we have Ghislaine Maxwell. And uh, I spent quite a bit of time on a, on a little video about her just talking about the grooming tactics that she used with these children to get them into the group. T tell me your thoughts on Ghislaine and, and uh, the, the, predicament she's in right now fascinating woman you know can can pilot helicopters you know she spent time down in an undersea submarine you know um, was at the clinton wedding after all the scandal broke she's at chelsea clinton's wedding friends with trump friends with ivanka Iv ivana trump, uh, trump you know uh fascinating woman whose father was some kind of intelligence operative we believe she's an intelligence operative as well, too. Uh, the latest thing I heard from Hoffenberg, he thinks that um, uh, she gave all her blackmail dirt over to Epstein, and he controlled it. 
Now, she inserted herself, too, by the way, into that Virgin Islands case by actually suing the estate of Epstein, demanding that they, when she was like on the land out there, demanding that they keep paying her to, for her to stay hidden and for her legal fees and stuff like that. Amazing. Now, do you, uh, go, please go ahead. I'm sorry, Ed. And one more interesting thing I found about Elaine Maxwell is the woman who claimed she was her spokeswoman for a long time. I believe her name was Gold. Uh, Sylvia Gold, I believe. But, but don't quote me on that. Somehow this woman who doesn't seem to have a lot of uh, credibility at this. Somehow this woman managed to get a White House press credentials to be in the daily White House briefing room with no, as a freelancer, okay? And so you, oh, you wow. what is going on? You know, and there's more, see the thing is, the more you start looking into this weird stuff, there's more questions than there are answers. Well, Epstein had some kind of a deal where he was uh, uh, subleasing a, a piece of property from the State Department. It was a formerly an embassy. And it just, it, it's just, you know, it, it's just crazy. Well, right in front of our face, you know? And uh, the crux- it, really, it really is a, 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 a really goofy octopus and the tentacles are all over the place. As I've looked at this case, I've, I've marveled at the power and influence that Maxwell must yield. And I'm wondering if her secret black book is also impacting Brunel. What are your thoughts there? You know, that's another thing. Too. Everybody talks about the, you know, the the black books and the, the blackmail dirt that they had. Uh, you, you never really see them use it, though. You know what I mean? Uh, Epstein wound up in MDC, you know. Well, by the way, too, we know that when he was in MDC that he, he had contraband in his cell. We saw his contraband in his house. He had extra jumpsuits, all kind of extra material in there. So, and that was one of the most, when I was back in New York and he used to work on those big organized crime cases, that's where uh, we used to have to go to visit the defendants. And um, it, it was, at the time, it was considered the most corrupt jail in the city where you could sneak stuff in, contraband and stuff like that, and bring in stuff, uh, sandwiches, you know, whatever you want. And uh, so I guess that reputation goes till today. Now, wow. where's Maxwell's uh, dirt? Where's her body? She doesn't seem to understand the charges against her and, and wasn't prepared for her arrest. She didn't even have a legal team or a bail bondsman in place before her arrest. Uh, it's just uh, a mystery. So yeah, why is that? Is that is that arrogance that I'll never be caught? Or, or was she abandoned at the last minute and left alone? I mean, what's your thought? I don't think she was abandoned and left alone, okay, because she has that new husband who has a lot of money, too, and she had that mansion that she purchased. Uh, so I, it's a mystery. I don't. I couldn't tell you. It's a mystery. So much of this is a mystery, you know? Yeah. Uh, and, but if you Amazing. look at so, yeah. oh, Go ahead. I'm sorry. If you look at what? If you look at some of their names on Epstein's flight log, you know, President of Israel, President of Columbia, you know, he's got the juice, you know, Harvard, you know, he had Harvard in his pocket, MIT he had in his pocket. You know, but in fact, you know, at MIT, he was funding the MIT Media Research Lab, okay? So they were on top of this, man. They were on top of this with the tabloids, they're controlling the tabloids, and even the social media, you know, like what comes up and what doesn't come up, you know? Yeah, so... So so let's uh, let's put on a conspiracy hat for a moment. Now now Epstein's sitting in jail. The the uh, conspiracies are flying left and right of whether he commits suicide or there is a orchestrated hit on him. What's your thought? That's a good question. You know, well, there's, there's a third possibility too. That they just walked him right out of there. Okay. Um, which which is the third possibility? Is that because because nobody's seen the body and can? Well, yeah, and well, supposedly they had the body burned, you know, burned like the next day. Or something. <laughs> then his brother went in and got fired. Then his brother goes in and hires Cyril Weck, I think it is, uh, to say, "Well, we had all these injuries. He was killed." We're supposed to believe uh, Epstein's brother. Epstein's brother, half of his property and half of his money is in Epstein's brother's name. Okay, and uh, he did that will too and created that trust the day before the, the death, the suicide, or the uh, extraction. Now, I had a case one time I, in Philadelphia where a guy uh, got a work for a furlough to leave the prison, okay? He leaves the prison. He goes and he shoots and he kills somebody, right? Assassination. It turns out the gun that he used came from a police evidence locker, okay? So if something like that can go on in Philadelphia, yeah. a little, little thing with nobody or nothing, right? God only knows what this guy could pull off because he only well, needs the, the Department of Corrections, the, the Commissioner of the Department of Corrections in New York in your pocket. Now, how hard is that? 
You know, look at Bernie Carrick, who he was hard at head of the Department of Corrections in New York. That guy was a, a convicted felon right now. Okay, we're stealing money, stealing money from nine eleven victims. Okay, so so in your opinion, if I'm catching this, yeah. you got to give a few percentage points to the fact that this guy could have been smuggled out of jail and living somewhere in the world under a new identity and enjoying life. You're the profiler. You tell me, right? <laughs> and I, I, I was, no, no, no. I was hoping to hook you on this no, one. <laughs> I got a question for you, okay? If, All right. um, if I'm running an intelligence operation, okay, either a private one or Mossad or CIA or State Department, something like that, right? And uh, the, Maxwell was intel. He groomed his kid, Galen, to be intel. Now, here we got... Uh, uh, one of my guys is Jeffrey Epstein. He's out there blackmailing people and doing all this kind of stuff like that, and sending back information, right? Can I be seen leaving him hanging out in the wind because everybody else is watching? You're going you're gonna to let him hang in the wind? You're going to let me hang in the wind too? Okay. So I'm, would, well, now what do you think? These intelligence agencies, would they do that or would they let one of their guys hang out in the wind or would they bring him in? No man left behind. Yeah, that's really interesting because yeah. so many people would be at risk if information got out that that makes that an interesting possibility. So so we have this one that we got to hang on to that's possible this guy could have been smuggled out because nobody can say, here's the DNA on this dead body that we're putting in the, mm -hmm. in the uh, burner to cremate, right? Mike, I think it is too. But what about the, the viral uh, uh, Epstein didn't kill himself? Right, viral goes. You're you're in the, you're trying to promote your your website, your blog, and stuff like that, and your YouTube. Right? How hard is it to make something go viral? Okay, it's very difficult. It doesn't happen easy. How did Epstein didn't kill himself become so viral so quick? It's on Fox News. It's here. It's there. And first, got to put on Fox News with some some Navy SEAL guy. <laughs> okay, you know, what's going on? Yeah. Uh, wow. Uh, yeah. The, the, That's a big and, price. Yeah. Big price to pay for a viral video, isn't it? To yeah. to. Uh, to promote something that is just a possibility, you know, and I always kind of focus on probabilities. So I'm going to leave it in the possibility bucket. And you and I have, uh, I think, done a great job of both avoiding an answer in what our opinions are, which I think <laughs> is great. So that's perfect. So then we have to step to, uh, was the guy murdered? They had him in there with that crazy cop, man. You know, that's a whole other thing. Why'd they put him in there with that murdering guy with all those muscles and stuff like that? He could have killed him with one arm, right? Uh, so who knows? Or, and, yeah, and, and, and frankly, we don't have of, really any evidence, do we, to show how he died? But there's a lot of mysterious stuff, too, about the injuries, according to Cyril Weck, I believe it was, and also through the video cameras being lost and the guards being asleep and stuff like that. But if I was going to extract the guy, I'd throw all that kind of stuff in there. You know, I, I would throw that in there. If, if I was going to pull an extraction, I'd say, okay, let's destroy the cameras and let's, uh, you know, maybe put a sleeping pill in, in the guy's coffee or something like that, you know? Like, you know. Why not? This, this is what these guys have pros, right? Yeah, really interesting. So I, we gotta we gotta leave that one up. And then of course there's the suicide, and and you know there was just a, a documentary on a few nights ago about that where they focused a little bit on the the suicide and and uh, is it practical that in the position that he was found that he could have created and strangled himself in a suicidal attempt? And and I have to say yes, it's possible, mm -hmm. um, but. Is it probable that it happened that way? I don't know. What are your thoughts, sir? Again, I haven't studied it, okay? No, this was, I haven't studied that. But the thing is, um, uh, the, he did prepare this will the day before. And uh, some people do believe, uh, and some people believe, too, his brother uh, would be suicidal, too. He's very nervous and would be suicidal, too, as well. Um, yeah, and don't, that behaviorally, that's pretty important that he prepares the will ahead of time, unless it's an orchestrated thing to make it look like I'm distraught and I'm getting my will put in place. And when, if, if the conspiracy theory of he's uh, smuggled away, what better thing to do than to say, yeah, here's the behavioral proof. The guy does a will. He's, he's depressed. He knows he's facing a lifetime in prison. Uh, he's remorseful about all the things he's done and it's become so much. He kills himself. I mean, it, it is really uh, something made for television. Well, one thing I can tell you this, he's not remorseful for anything he's done, because uh, I know people that, that knew him. Uh, I just 
uh, I think it was Ian Halpern I just interviewed recently who had met Epstein when he was, and Epstein was defending his behavior and saying, this was a different period of time. This was normal back a long time ago. He was defending his behavior. Yeah, uh, that's, that's amazing. It seems like well, he defended his behavior to a lot of people. Yeah, I mean, what becomes the legacy of this case in your opinion? That's a good question. I think there's so much confusion right now in it and so much uh, 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 misinformation being tossed around. You know, like after the death, I, I was called by all these reporters, BBC all over the world, UK Mail, Daily Mail, all these different reporters. And I was shocked at how naive they were and how little they knew about what really went on. But then looking back, I, I kind of think, that some of these guys were trying to plant ideas in my head to, to make me question uh, people I was talking to and sources and stuff, uh, that there was a little double dirty going on there too as well. You know, that, you know there was a book published about Epstein, uh, by a, a, a negative book supposedly about Epstein, right? a tell-all book about Epstein, by a woman who uh, 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 runs a uh, advocacy group for, for human trafficking. But interesting uh, that the, the publisher she chose is the former Mossad agent, Victor Ostrowski, who called me on the phone, <laughs> okay, uh, to tell you, yeah, I know. So why would someone who want, and by the way, she was, I, I have an interview with her as well, so you can find her on my speaker channel. It also turns out that the law firm she uses is Kirkland Ellis, the same law firm that Epstein used. So she's writing a book about Epstein. They got the same lawyer, and the only publisher she can find in the world is a Mossad, an ex-Mossad agent, who who's, who wrote a book called "You Using Deception <laughs> to Get Your Your to Attain Your Goals," and oh talks about in his book about sex trafficking operations and underage sex trafficking operations uh, in his book. So there's so many levels to all this, Mike. You know that. Uh, yeah, it's good. this is this is an onion that's going to continue to be pilled for years, don't you think? Yes, exactly. And, and, but and it's sort of like the JFK assassination conspiracy, where you don't know what to believe anymore because it's so, you know, the shadow is here, and you know, in the windows, Christ, you know, and it's just so much. And everyone seems to have some kind of an intel background or some kind of shady background in the whole thing. So yeah, Epstein is a and I, I've, I've given up that the truth, the total truth, will ever totally come out in the Epstein case. Yeah, this this is amazing. Well, folks, we're, I'm talking to Ed Opperman from oppermanreport.com. You've got to make sure you go to his website and check out his site. you got to make sure you take time to go and look at his broadcast weekly at 5 p.m. Uh, Pacific time. And don't miss his podcast and other things. Ed, how are they going to best be able to find you? On Spreaker, Spreaker.com. You can find that link on the oppermanreport.com. And uh, I put up three hours of new content every Friday night. I put two interviews, and then I'll do a, a solo one-hour live on Spreaker exclusively. Um, then uh, my Patreon, if you go to Opperman Report Patreon, I put up eight hours of new content each month. Uh, plus, I put up a, a ad-free. The stuff that you hear on AMFM radio, you can hear for free, ad-free on Patreon. I put it up, and we're starting to schedule it, and I do it every night. Uh, but I also put up all kinds of documents, too, on, on the Patreon for free. Uh, like um, that, that, uh, the, the lawsuit against Lynn Wood by his partner, which is hysterical. Okay, I put that up just recently. And uh, oh, all kinds of stuff uh, uh, that I found. Oh, the OSU lawsuit, you know, the OSU scandal with those wrestlers over there. I interviewed one of the victims. I interviewed one of the lawyers, and he sent me the complaint. And, and so I love, I love putting up court docs when I can get them. And I was just sent, what was it? Oh, the referral against Lynn Wood. Uh, by the Detroit uh, the referral to the Bar Association trying to get his bar license pulled in Detroit. I got a hold of that from the New York Times uh, a reporter who was supposed to be interviewing today, but he had to cancel. And uh, that put that up just last night. And so there's always fun activity going on. Uh, by the way, too, you want to know what? I have exclusively, I, well, I had it exclusively, and now everybody else has it, the 24-page letter uh, that Jeffrey Epstein's attorney wrote during the plea negotiations that where he claimed that he was responsible for creating the global Clinton initiative, the Clinton foundation. And this 24 page letter that I obtained exclusively when it first came out, uh, he, Epstein goes into great detail. He helped the Clintons create the Clinton foundation and the global Clinton initiative. I forget what it's something initiative, but I forget what it's called, but I had that exclusively for a long time. And that's in uh, uh, Patreon. 
That is amazing. Well, and and uh, recently you you interviewed me about my new book, and I really appreciate that because you have such a huge audience all around the world. But uh, that was a great opportunity to actually be interrogated by you. So thanks so much for that. I really enjoyed that story very much. That's a fascinating story. I love stories about cults, and, uh, and not that I love cults, but just I just think it's fascinating the way uh, uh, they, they and they take over a town. Like you were talking to, to as well, you know. They just have so much influence and power. Yeah, it's amazing. Well, everyone, uh, I am so grateful to my guest today, Ed Opperman, uh, oppermanreport.com. Please make sure you're checking him out. And I want to leave you with this. If you ever feel threatened or concerned about your safety, keep in mind that there is a cadre of law enforcement and other professionals that are out there that will provide you help. So please get immediately with your local law enforcement agency, your mental health provider, or your medical provider and get help. It If you're in a domestic violence situation, folks, it does not get better. If you're being exploited in some way, your gut is telling you that it's happening. Get out and get the help. And until we have a chance to meet again, uh, thank you so much. Ed, I hope you'll come back. Oh, sure, anytime in. I really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Profiling Evil podcast. If you enjoyed the show, don't forget to rate us and review us wherever you get your podcasts. And please, don't forget to go to our YouTube channel where you can watch some of the hundreds of videos we've created. Now, if you're looking for a great crime story, check out my new book, Deceived, an investigative memoir of the Zion Society cult. You can find it at profilingevil.com. While you're there, you can also sign up for our elite newsletter, the Bolo. I'm Mike King and thanks for listening.